to see uh, so many people here, particularly uh, a lot of friends who have come back. It's we have a lot of meetings at the New America Foundation, and, and we're always a little nervous that uh, the people will get tired of that. So I'm, I'm glad to see that that's not true. I'm Jeffrey Lewis. I'm the director of the Nuclear Strategy and Nonproliferation Initiative here at the New America Foundation. Uh, and I am, I'm, I'm really excited about today's talk. Uh, I have uh, uh, a very old friend, Gregory Kulaki, here with whom I have recently written a paper on uh, China's ASAT test. Uh, and Gregory is going to talk about that a little bit. It's, uh, it's a sort of excellent timing for an event like this. Uh, there seems to be a lot of news interest. For those of you who don't know, uh, earlier today at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, uh, Russia, on behalf of Russia and China, submitted a draft treaty uh, calling for a sort of ban on the deployment of weapons in space. Uh, and Gregory and I were talking about this. This is something that we've been following for quite a long time. It's been uh, probably a central issue in the debate in the Conference on Disarmament over a work plan uh, since about 2000. And actually, I, if I can promote my, myself, I have a, a, my book is on sale out there. And the appendix is actually every working paper that the Chinese have ever submitted to the Conference on Disarmament on the subject of outer space. And they've basically submitted a paper about every two years, every year since, since 2000. And so Gregory and I were talking, and, and, and Gregory said to me, well, why all of the media interest right now? I mean, this is a sort of recurring uh, Chinese position in the CD, uh, regular issuance of working papers. Why is it that the press is interested in this issue now? And I, and I think the answer is pretty obvious. It's because of China's January 2007 ASAT test. Uh, and I think that accounts uh, for a substantial amount of the interest in, in China's position in, in the CD. That, of course, raises the natural question, why did the Chinese do it? And that's the subject of uh, Gregory in my paper, which uh, we uh, have submitted and I think will be probably published this summer, although I don't want to jump ahead of, of the peer review. Gregory is going to discuss uh, a broader issue of whether or not the United States is going to have a space race with China, uh, which is based not just on the work that we've done in China on the motives behind uh, the ASAT test, uh, but also, uh, I think, the sort of sum total of his experiences as uh, the principal person with the Union of Concerned Scientists who works on facilitating uh, exchange between U.S. and Chinese scientific and technical communities uh, with an emphasis on arms control issues. I think better than anybody in the world, uh, Gregory has a really deep and, and nuanced understanding of how the two technical communities exist on their own and, and how they uh, interact together or, or fail to interact, I guess, is probably the more, more frequent mode. Um, Gregory is uh, probably the person I know who is the most comfortable uh, foreigner in China. He has the best Chinese of anyone I know, Chinese and exaggerating and, and is and 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 what what's really a pleasure is to watch Gregory in a sort of situation of of, of translation, because uh, he's one of these people who I think is probably one of the most effective cross cultural communicators, and that I think uh, makes him uh, so successful in in navigating this question of how scientific and, techni and technical communities uh, interact with one another. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Gregory. He's going to talk for probably 20 or 30 minutes, uh, maybe a little more. And then, uh, then I, I, I'll, I'll bat clean up for a few minutes, and then, and then we will take questions. So please join me in welcoming Gregory Kulaki. Is this on? Does it work? Are you going to stand? Um, I can. Do you need me to quick slides for you? No, you don't. I have the cooker thing. Hi. Thanks for coming. He's exaggerating, especially on the Chinese language and cultural communication stuff, but I have spent a lot of time in China. I first went in 1984 to 86 as a uh, I got a scholarship from Fudan University in Shanghai, uh, the first one from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, I went back with the Sister City Committee in Baltimore in 1987 for a couple months, three months, and then spent 10 years in China from 1989 to 1999 uh, directing uh, academic and professional exchange programs for the Council on International Educational Exchange. And since 2002, I've been doing something similar. Uh, with a different group of people, though, uh, these what we would call the defense science community in China, uh, the people who work out in the institutions like the Institute of Applied Physics and Computational Mathematics or the 
Chinese Academy of Engineering Physics uh, and communications with their counterparts in the United States. One of the things I've been most responsible for in the last five years since coming on was to develop the existing relationships the Union of Concerned Scientists had in the nuclear community uh, to the space community. And we've a project at uh, the Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics with the Institute of Space Science there uh, where we uh, facilitate exchanges on, we don't call it space security, we call it the sustainability of space resources, which makes conducting uh, activities on these questions a lot, a lot easier uh, to administer over there. Um, today's talk is about this whole question of a space race, which I couldn't avoid a few months ago when I must have gotten calls from 10 reporters uh, asking me about uh, to comment on this lunar probe, the Chang uh, lunar probe that uh, China has sent up to the moon. And I noticed that I was not quoted in a single one of the, of the newspaper stories uh, that I was interviewed for. Uh, and the reason for that is because I refused to accept and argued against this premise uh, that China is racing with the United States in space. Um, and I think that what I've discovered in talking about this with colleagues and the general public in both countries is that there's an enormous disconnect between the way this is perceived in China and the way it's perceived in the United States. Uh, and I think we need to deal with that uh, communication disconnection if we're going to resolve this whole question of how the United States and China are going to relate to each other uh, in space. The United States is already present. China has now developed a robust capability to be an active participant in space that will only continue to progressively increase over time. And so this question of how we're going to relate to each other in space is, is a pretty important one. Um, and the Chinese perspective, professionally and in the general public, is I think summed up in the caption of this picture, which is, you know, we can go to, we can travel in space too. In other words, this is a place that we can go to now. This is a photograph from an exhibition at the, at the district exhibition hall uh, in Haidian, just outside of Beijing University, that was put up just after the, or just before the Shenzhou 6 mission. Um, <coughs> inside of there, it was basically an exhibition about us, about the United States. Almost all of the materials, uh, all of the films, all of the pictures, all of the story of the history, with the exception of maybe a, a, a statue of Wan Hu, the guy who lit firecrackers and tried to travel into space many centuries ago, uh, and some photos of the history of the Russian program and European programs, but it was very U.S. focused. And I was very touched by the wall in the back when they had this uh, exhibition on the sacrifices. Uh, these are the uh, astronauts who died in the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster. And there was a long videotape in Chinese about the risks of space. And it was almost sort of preparing, in a way, the Chinese public for the fact that, you know, uh, China's, you know, this is not an easy thing that uh, is being conducted here, and China needs to prepare itself for the sort of struggles of possible failure in space. But the director of the Institute of Space Science, where we have our program, is Chi Fa Ren, who's a very instrumental figure in the Chinese space program and actually designed the Shenzhou 1 through 5 spacecraft. And on the anniversary of the launch of their first satellite into space, which was in 1971, they, they launched their first satellite in 1970, he was talking about what are the biggest obstacles to China's progress. Uh, and he said that it was the fear of failure, uh, that this was a risky business. But in, any, in, in, in a general sense, China has a, the Chinese public and Chinese professionals have a very positive view of the U.S. space program, in general, of the U.S. space program. Um, and they see themselves as now becoming a part of a larger human community. That's, this is the propaganda line, and I think it's also the general sentiment, you know, that humanity's dream, right, uh, you know, pursuing space. Um, this is a picture, a poster, actually, from an environmental uh, awareness contest that was sponsored by the Wrigley Spearmint, uh, the Wrigley Chewing Gum Company uh, in Jiangsu Province, and it says, uh, you know, uh, a hidden danger to the earth, space debris. Uh, and this is a year before 
uh, the 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 anti-satellite test. And then here you see uh, you know Chinese students at, a, at a, an exhibition on the uh, uh, Shenzhou program. They view their attempt in this program the same way uh, a lot of people in the United States view our piloted program in Apollo. Uh, it's going to recruit engineers and young people and get them interested in science and technology. And it's going to provide seed money for all kinds of, you know, unanticipated but hoped for spin-off technologies. And they always talk about how the fact that the dollar invested in the Apollo program, you know, yielded seven dollars in, you know, uh, related, G, uh, you know, economic growth, GDP. Our views of their program are, are really starkly different. Um, this is from a 2002 article by a senior planner at NASA who paints the image of uh, China getting to the moon uh, and taking our flag down. And how would we feel about that? How would we feel about China getting to the moon, you know, putting humans on the moon before us and, and taking our flag down? Right. Uh, and Administrator Griffin, right before a critical vote on NASA funding last fall, also invoked this idea of the Chinese beating us to the moon, right? That I think the Chinese will put a person on the moon before we get back in order to sort of prompt uh, legislators in order to increase funding for the NASA budget. Um, this was written by a, a person at the Cato Institute. It was published in the Washington Times the day after their first space launch where he talks about NASA's high costs and China, uh, uh, you know, uh, out-competing us uh, in space. They're going to put people up and things up more cheaply. Uh, but note the tone, right, that if China has more people in space, right, that that could adversely influence the nature of commercial and even security regime that emerges in orbit. There's a clear sense of wanting to keep them out that's communicated in that sort of sentiment. Um, that is interesting, I mean, just as a, as a phenomenon. And then there's these comparisons to, you know, Star Wars, and I, th I think, I mean, Star Trek. And I guess the most upsetting thing about this particular reference, they talk about the, uh, everybody knows Star Trek, right, with the Klingons and the United Federation. And they compare the Chinese to the, you know, the adversary of the United Federation, the Klingons. Uh, you know, talking about them being, you know, not quite technically as sophisticated, but they're sneaky. Which conjures up all kinds of images um, which are worth thinking about in terms of uh, cultural communication. But the thing that angers me most is that anybody that is familiar with Star Trek knows that the Russians are the Klingons and the Chinese are the Romulans. It's, you know, <laughs> pick, the, pick the right analogy. Now, that's not to say that there are not hostile views of the U.S. space program uh, in China. Uh, they exist. And they exist <coughs> primarily within the military and primarily within the section of the military, the political officers in the military, the people who are in the war colleges and who are writing books for general consumption. Uh, uh, and you know, their job is to generate, uh, you know, I mean, you could call it political propaganda or you could call it political indoctrination but it's to generate you know, this kind of literature for the, the rank and file in the military. Where they talk about the United States wanting to fight space wars. Uh, here's a book on, you know, the battlefield and air and space and the, and the Chinese Air Force. Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting about these articles, though, is that they're <coughs> generally not written by space professionals. Uh, this is an art article from uh, Chinese Aerospace, which is a, 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 a relatively serious Chinese aerospace journal uh, where it talks about military aerospace. But I want you to take a good look at that picture. Uh, I didn't notice it, actually. My son did uh, when it was sitting on my desk. That's Lego. Mm -hmm. This is a Lego spacecraft with little copies of the Lego spacecraft. And the, the thing is a space weapon, you know, obliterates a space target. Um, there's a sensational quality to a lot of this writing. Now, in the United States, in China, these things are viewed separately, right? There's this positive view of the American civil space program and the general American space effort, but there's this uh, also concern and sometimes hostility towards U.S. 
military space uh, technology and military space efforts, right? But there's a separation, an ability to hold both of those two views of U.S., the general U.S. space effort, in common at the same time. It's okay to do the civil program. We're not threatened by it. We want to join it. It's a great thing for humanity. But, uh, you know, they have this military component too. Whereas what we do is we lump them together, right? China can't have a robust civil program. We don't want to cooperate with China on moon missions or in piloted space or let them be part of the space station because we view the same things, we view them as one and the same thing. That any gain in their civilian program is going to further their military ambitions. We link the two much more closely in our consciousness and in our debate about this, in, in this town in particular, uh, than they do with us. Uh, so you can, you know, they talk about prestige, but it's a, civil, it's a military, not a, a civil agenda uh, that China is pursuing. Now, one of the things that I've learned reading through U.S. reports and documents uh, that informs our intelligence community on the Chinese space program is that a lot of the information that our analysts and intelligence officers are consuming that's driving their perceptions of Chinese intent regarding their civil and their military space program is based on very shoddy sources. Um, there was, for example, two years in a row, annual reports to Congress on Chinese military power, this rumor of a Chinese parasitic satellite that could sneak up to a U.S. satellite and blow it up. Uh, and in chasing that source down, it turns out that it's from an individual's website, a blogger named Hong Chao Fei, who made the, the whole thing up. And if you looked at all the other stuff on his website, there's all kinds of secret weapons that the Chinese are going to use. Uh, little sophisticated radio devices that are so cheap to produce that they can be given to every peasant in China uh, that will be able to jam the, the, the avionics on U.S. aircraft as they fly over China. I mean, a whole host of similar things like that. And yet, two years in a row, it's in a report to Congress. Uh, our National Air and Space Intelligence Center, we discovered they mistranslated Chinese sources uh, on Chinese interested in anti-satellite weapons. This was anecdotally coming across to me as I was looking through this information. Um, and it's longer lived. There was a very influential report, for example, by a uh, former military attache, Mark Stokes, was talking about Chinese interest in a space shuttle and how that space shuttle, the interest in that space shuttle was, uh, you know, uh, connected to anti-satellite uh, capability that they wanted to acquire. Uh, and he cites a source, but when you look at the source, it has nothing to do with the claims he's making about the Chinese space shuttle. It's an article by three Chinese graduate students who are talking about how to move a, you know, 200, uh, a, you know, a, a 5,000 uh, kilogram mass to a, from a parking orbit uh, 200 kilometers up to geo using low thrust technology. And actually, if you, they actually cite the American sources they use in this article, and if they, they crib the whole thing. I mean, they, they crib the whole article from the original uh, American source. And yet this turned up uh, in a very influential report on Chinese strategic military modernization from the late 1990s. Now, the consequence of that information in the 90s was the Cox Commission report and these claims that these connections that had been developing between China and the United States on commercial and civil space were uh, going back to the 1950s, these connections between uh, Chinese uh, uh, space scientists and American space scientists were responsible for their development. Uh, and that therefore the policy response to that is to cut off Chinese access to our space community. And since 1999, that's, the, that's our policy. Uh, to the point where, for example, this summer, the International Space University was held uh, on the campus of the Beijing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics in Beijing. And NASA personnel who attended were specifically told prior to departure not to talk to their Chinese colleagues. Uh, they were there for six weeks. I mean, you can imagine the atmosphere, uh, the, the nature of the relationship that starts to develop when you have these kinds of rules in place. Um, those, that atmosphere undermined 
uh, the initiative of the director of NASA, uh, uh, the administrator, Michael Griffin, when he went to China in September of 2006 or 2007. Yeah. Now, there's been very little contact between these two communities. Uh, one of the stories in the press about this, for example, that he was not allowed to visit the launch site out in uh, uh, western China. When, in fact, many other Americans have, have, have gone to visit there. For example, Mark Kirk and Rick Larson, who run the House China Working Group, uh, who've been in, involved in trying to revive this uh, a possibility of cooperation between China and the United States. The States they, they went out there last summer. They met Yan Li Wei. They got a personal tour of every little inch of the place from the general who runs it. Um, so it's not a, it's not a, it's a, it's not a question of them hiding something or something secret being there. It's a question of the nature of the official relationship between the two space communities. Um, it's very deeply felt on the Chinese side. They're understandably quite proud of their accomplishments in space. So for the United States to say, for example, that all of your developments are due to the fact that you stole stuff from us uh, is, is, is insulting to a lot of, especially the senior Chinese aerospace engineers, uh, to the point where before the 2005 launch of their first piloted mission, the Shenzhou 5 mission, uh, NASA gave debris data uh, to the Chinese in order to allow them to schedule their launch window so that they would minimize the risk of the spacecraft being hit by space debris. Um, and the person who was in charge of that on the Chinese side told me uh, this came very late in their planning, right? They hadn't announced their launch window publicly to anyone, but they'd already set it long before. Uh, and he was, this, this relationship is so bad that he was convinced that NASA did that on purpose to mess them up, to make them move their launch window. And he actually got pressure from the political leadership in China, which was very concerned with this being a successful mission, to reschedule. They said, well, the Americans have given us this data. I mean, we've got to trust their, they're much better at this than we are. You know, we've got to trust their uh, judgment. We should reschedule. And he had to argue with the political leadership, no, we know enough. We've got good enough capability. We can set the launch window and should, you should let me uh, go forward about it. It's very animated uh, during that discussion. There's a lot of mistrust and bad feelings. That said, <coughs> China did blow up a, a weather satellite, creating an enormous amount of debris, um, which, while it may only pose a additional 1% increased risk to spacecraft on orbit, and which, if you add it all together, doesn't add up to all the debris that the United States has created in 50 years of space flight, which is some of the things you hear from uh, some of the Chinese officials who've been asked to comment on this. Um, it was an extraordinarily irresponsible act um, to the international space community. So much so that a conference, and China, by the way, has led the way on mitigation of debris. Uh, they've spent an enormous amount of money uh, redesigning their launch vehicles and their spacecraft so that they would com could comply with uh, international guidelines on debris mitigation to create as less junk as possible uh, uh, while you're, uh, you know, during your activities in space. And there was actually going to be an international agreement signed on that in March. This was done in January. And they had to cancel the meeting at the last minute uh, because of the uproar in this professional space community about the debris consequences that were created by this uh, satellite, by this experiment. What this had the effect in the United States was that all talk of cooperation at NASA with the U.S. House China Working Group, we, it, we couldn't even bring it up. It was just a political non-starter. I mean, how could you possibly cooperate with the Chinese after they've done something uh, as irresponsible as this in space? Um, but I'm wondering. Uh, whether that was the right policy response. Um, there are these two sides, civil and military. Uh, they're the same 
groups of people and it's the same technology, but in both countries, it's two separate groups of individuals involved. I mean, there's overlap, obviously, in both countries, but they are distinct. We're so focused on one aspect of this, the military aspect, that I think it's preventing us from seeing other potential aspects of this relationship and competition <coughs> with China. This was a paper by a fellow at uh, uh, Carnegie, Ashley Tellis, that's been discussed a lot. And he talks about this idea of geopolitical rivalry, which I think is an interesting and important question to consider. But he talks about it just in terms of this tactical military capability that China would get from an ASAC. Now, it's not a new argument. This was the essential point that was in the uh, Rumsfeld Commission report. And actually, he took the name uh, of his article about soft ribs and hitting the United States in their weak spot and their soft ribs from a, a Chinese newspaper article that was cited in that original uh, Pentagon uh, report, Rumsfeld Commission report. And the whole idea was that satellites are vulnerable. We re the United States relies on them a lot to conduct warfare uh, at a distance. And so it would be an easy target uh, uh, for the Chinese. Uh, but the interesting thing about this article is that three quarters of it don't have anything to do with space. And all of the information that the graduate student, again, another graduate student, this time at National Defense University, publishes in this article comes from our sources. This was a summary of things he was reading in the United States, not an original Chinese piece of analysis. Um, which gets back to this whole question of the quality of the information and how we perceive these communities. What we've done, and uh, one of the papers I'll have uh, published uh, after the one with Jeffrey, is that we've gone back and we've looked at 1,500 articles published in China uh, that reference anti-satellite weapons from 1971 through 2007. And most of are in this quality of sort of general information reviews or these sort of political diatribes, these propaganda, propaganda pieces that you get from the People's Liberation Army. Uh, and a relatively small percentage of them are actually from the technical research institutes uh, that are involved in the development of Chinese space technology, military and civilian, and analysts in some of the you know, uh, academic institutions that, uh, and research institutions that look at this question. Um, and the Chinese have a word for these kind of articles like this. They call them la jiwentang. Every time I go over the Chinese military power report with my Chinese colleagues, uh, they talk about, why are you reading all these la jiwentang, these trash articles? They're things that people have to publish because they got to publish something. And they throw them out there. They're very low value and, 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 and not read uh, in, in, in China. And if you look at the citations in US reports on this, we're undervaluing of the journals that actually might contain information that could tell us something meaningful uh, about the Chinese uh, uh, ASAT capabilities and Chinese uh, military space capabilities. And here's the, the top 10. Uh, and these, you know, the top the, the, the six of these are affiliated with research institutes in the Chinese Aerospace Industrial Corporation and the Chinese Aerospace Corporation, which are the two large Chinese aerospace conglomerates. And when you go through all that literature, you look at how we've really, the conventional wisdom in the United States is that China's caught off guard by what they saw in the Gulf War, and they're shocked at military space capabilities, and they're scrambling to respond to acquire some sort of capability that can allow them to survive in a, in a, in a, modern, in a modern war. And while there's elements of truth to that, right, if you look at the technical research, they saw all this coming in the late 1970s and the, in the mid-1980s, when the, our relationship with China was quite good, uh, before the Gulf War ever happened, right? they saw all, the, all these technologies in the pipeline already. Uh, and the actual ASAT program that they themselves tested in January was begun at that time. It was one of the first projects that was uh, funded by this, uh, military projects funded by this Project 863, which was uh, passed in, in, in uh, which I'll return to in a second, in, in 1986. Um, 
And also, when you look through these articles, there's this idea that there's this Taiwan crisis, this very real tense situation that creates the most likely possibility for war with the United States. Uh, and Chinese military planning is obviously centered on that scenario. But there's a supposition that because of that, their interest in ASET technology uh, and their research on these hit-to-kill systems and their research on all this military space te technology is also focused on resolving that scenario in a way uh, that's favorable to them. Um, and when you look through the literature, it just isn't borne out by the way they write about it. They want to acquire a capability that they believe any advanced nation has to acquire. They don't want to be behind the curve on the de development of military space technology. It's a general, important capability. It's not focused on any particular problem they need to resolve. And I think that's something that's lacking because of the sources we use and cite in the American uh, community. Uh, an important consequence of that, by the way, is that they're not likely to trade it away, uh, even if the Taiwan situation were resolved tomorrow. Um, so uh, that's something to think about. So again, I think our focus is too narrow. And what we're missing in all this focus on this very interesting and uh, potentially problematic military situation is what's happening with the Chinese space program in general. Because we've shut them out, you know, in other words, they were planning, for example, on funding a lot of their space program with the money they were going to make launching U.S. and European uh, commercial satellites back in the 1990s. When we cut that revenue stream off and when we cut off cooperation, a new economic model uh, started to take shape. And the new economic model that's taking shape is that China wants to be the provider of choice for the developing world. They're building two large satellite design and production facilities, one in Beijing and one in Shanghai. Now, it's a consolidation of all the research institutes they've got in both of those cities, but there's also expansion involved. And they're focusing on microsatellites, um, cheap to launch, uh, relatively uh, inexpensive package that they can sell to partners in the world. And one of the efforts that they've launched is this Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation Organization, which now has nine members, Bangladesh, China, of course, Indonesia, Iran, Mongolia, Pakistan, Peru, Thailand, and Turkey joined in, in 2006. Uh, and their first successful foray into that was just last year with this launch of the Nigerian communication satellite. Um, there's also, they also have products in the pipeline for uh, one for Venezuela, uh, or sen a remote sensing satellite. So I'll, st I'll, I'll stop here by just noting that I think we need to broaden our strategic perspective when we think about competition and cooperation and space race and the space relationship between China and the United States to think about what's going on in the commercial and the scientific <coughs> arena. And I think we need to understand that China's interest in these technologies, right, um, is more fundamental and not so narrowly focused on some specific military objective. A lot of people mention, for example, this Project 863, and they talk about it like it's some sort of secret military project to um, you know, advance Chinese military technology, high technology. Ashley Tallis, for example, talks about it that way in his article in Carnegie. But Project 863 was originally, it, four Chinese scientists wrote a letter uh, to the Chinese <coughs> political leadership uh, after Reagan's Star Wars speech in the mid-1980s and said, look, you know, the United States is going to make major investments in these technologies, and we can't be behind. Right? And so they were writing this letter to the government saying, we need a fund to, you know, kickstart and jumpstart our high-tech uh, military programs. Um, and it was agreed to. But the focus, it was decided after three months of discussion between, say, 100 or so Chinese scientists, uh, what should we focus on? Should, we, should it be focused on basic research and basic science uh, and technology development, or, or should we focus on these military objectives? And they couldn't come to a consensus. 
So in the end, Deng Xiaoping said, look, the policy will be civilian takes the priority, where, but military should, you know, uh, dovetail and be, uh, you know, dual use uh, where we can. Because what was important was not the acquisition of some particular weapon system, which could be outdated or unuseful before you even finish making it. It was the generic capability and the ability to compete in high science and technology across the board. And Project 863 ever since then has been very broad based. It's environmental technology, it's energy technology, it's all kinds of technology and basic research. And that was reaffirmed in the most recent plan for Chinese science and technology development that was passed uh, uh, just before the recent uh, party congress last fall. Um, and the, the emphasis, this is the former, I don't know if she's still the director of the Ministry of Education, I think she's not anymore, but I, I believe this Chen Jili, I think she's still on the Central Committee. The focus now in the past was on keeping up with, monitoring, and copying what was going on abroad. And the emphasis now is that the Chinese want to innovate, create, produce our own stuff. Which brings me to my last point. Uh, in terms of the misperceptions and the, and the problems. Griffin got such a cold reception, in part, because his advance staff assumed that this was extraordinarily important to the Chinese, that they're dying for some sort of U.S. affirmation uh, of, of, of uh, the right to participate or cooperate, that they need us uh, more than we need them because of this asymmetry of capabilities. And that is just not true. They've made more progress in the years after the Cox report than they made in the, in the same equivalent amount of time before it. And the focus now is on actually this cutoff, this isolation has not been all that bad for Chinese aerospace and Chinese high technology. It's actually forced us to do this stuff on our own. And in the process, we'll be able to develop the capability not just to make the same things they make and understand how they work, not to, you know, keep up with foreign technology, but to develop their own leapfrog, develop innovative technology. Um, and in the context of that kind of a competition or relationship, I think the United States might want to at least reconsider uh, this isolated containment policy that we have in place uh, at present. And I'll, I'll stop it there. Looks great. Well, that's for, we want to uh, put something over that. Well, I, I, that's, that's, uh, Gregory's always difficult to come after, so I'm, I'm just going to speak for maybe, you know, at, at most 10 minutes just to talk a little bit about this, this treaty to put some of those issues on the table uh, for our discussion. When I, when I finish talking, I think what we're going to do, um, because the room's a little bit crowded, is we'll take questions in bunches of three and then I'll, I'll repeat them so that uh, we make sure everybody can hear them uh, and that the audio records them. Uh, and then uh, and uh, we'll let uh, we'll let Gregory answer them. But just to um, just to talk about the treaty a little bit because I, I think it's such an interesting policy uh, development. As, as I say, the uh, the the Russian Federation, uh, their mission to the CD, um, actually actually in this case it was the Foreign Minister of Russia. Uh, who went to the CD, uh, delivered a speech, and offered uh, a working paper that was basically a draft treaty submitted by Russia and China on uh, constraining the military uses of outer space. And that treaty really had two obligations. The first obligation is a ban on what they called weapons in space, which would be space-based missile defenses, space-based strike weapons, and, and space-based anti-satellites. And it also included an obligation not to use or threaten to use force against space objects, which would would uh, in some ways uh, constrain uh, anti-satellite programs, though arguably not their technological development. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting document, uh, and it's available uh, on a website maintained by the uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Uh, it's called, uh, it's reachingcriticalwill.org, uh, and they have the full text of, of the treaty. Now, what's interesting about the, the document, again, is it's getting all of this press, but it is, it is really very similar to the documents that the Chinese have been releasing since about 2000. Um, and as I say, I, I've got all of these documents in, in the appendix of the book, but I want to talk about two timing issues. Not so much the substance of the treaty, although, although we can discuss that, but really issues related uh, to timing. Uh, 
the most recent Chinese working papers, as I say, started in 2000, but there's one before that, and that was in 1985. Uh, and China submitted that working paper on, uh, on a legal agreement to constrain military activities in, in space, uh, precisely because they were worried about SDI. And what I find so interesting about the timing of that is that corresponds e directly to, as Gregory pointed out, the inauguration of the current hit-to-kill uh, anti-satellite program in, in China in the mid-1980s. And it, I think much as, as Gregory pointed out, there's long been this emphasis uh, on, on the one hand, securing political commitments that would uh, you know, ameliorate the Chinese strategic situation while at the same time being deeply interested in developing the same technologies that the United States and that at that time the Soviet Union were developing so that China didn't fall behind. And it's, it's that period in which we see the genesis of the current uh, Chinese anti-satellite um, uh, system or, or program. As, as I note, there was no, no working paper for another 15 years. The issue sort of went back on the back burner until it returned in 2000. And what's, what's interesting about 2000 is it comes in the wake of uh, the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade uh, and corresponds to a really serious effort on the part of the Clinton administration announced in January 2000 to move uh, U.S. ABM efforts from a sort of basic research and development phase to a real procurement phase where there would be deployment of assets. That speech actually was delivered by Secretary Cohen in uh, January of 2000, and by that spring, uh, Jiang Zemin, the president of China, was actually addressing the Conference on Disarmament, presenting the first of what would be a series of um, uh, Chinese statements that they were very serious about getting some kind of legal agreement to regulate military activities in outer space. Uh, and that sort of foreshadowed what would eventually be uh, the release of the first Chinese white paper. The reason I, I mention that is because that also corresponds, I think, uh, and Gregory and I mentioned this in the paper, with a substantial increase in funding for uh, this Chinese program to develop a hit-to-kill system. Uh, now, we saw that system come to fruition in, in January 2007 with the ASAT test, but it's worth noting that the technology involved is functionally identical to U.S. efforts to develop a hit-to-kill missile defense interceptor. It's, it's the same technology, and I think in all of our conversations, and, and Gregory couldn't correct me if he got a different impression, every Chinese uh, scientist or technical person we talk to conceives of that program as, the, as a, a program to develop hit-to-kill technologies, uh, a sort of general effort to acquire a modern military technology that the United States has, not as a program that's designed to develop a specific military system for a specific purpose. And, and I think that's really evident in the fact that the people conducting the research were the General Armaments Department, uh, which is charged with developing these sort of general uh, technologies, and it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't done by a service. It wasn't something that, that someone said, go out and build something that can do X. I raise all of this because I, I think when we look at the treaty, I mean, the way that I interpret these treaties, and we can talk about this a little bit, is that they're an effort by the Chinese to get some kind of political commitment that would constrain an open-ended uh, strategic competition with the United States, where the United States continues to modernize its strategic forces um, and forces China to do the same thing. Um, and to me, that seems perfectly consistent with China's interest in getting you know, political commitments on the one hand, but making the necessary investments in their own national defense science and technology so that they can keep pace. And that way, it's a hedge. One of the things that we talked about in our paper, which I thought was particularly interesting, is in the United States there was a kind of sense that the Chinese are releasing these white papers in Geneva, and yet they're also working on anti-satellites, and that that is somehow fundamentally disingenuous. But I think, and, and this really comes through in Gregory's paper, that's a, that's a very American-centric way of looking at it, as though, as though China's defense technology developments and China's diplomatic efforts are really all about us. And I, and I think that that's probably the wrong assumption to make. I mean, it seems to me that the Chinese, on the one hand, have a general interest in a positive political relationship with the United States and see arms control and treaties as one way to achieve that. Um, but they also have a very strong interest in maintaining their defense science and technology base, and they're certainly interested in keeping pace and developing technologies as a hedge, uh, particularly if the political relationship doesn't pan out so well. It's worth, I think, making a couple of notes about the precise nature uh, of the planning for the test, um, because I, I think this will also inf go to some of the things uh, that Gregory talked about, and will get me to the sort of bigger point I want to raise about what kind of relationship we choose to have uh, with the Chinese. Uh, 
in looking at the Chinese reasons for the test, Gregory and I think both came back with a very a very bureaucratic and technical understanding of, of what had happened. Rather than seeing these sort of broad strategic interests, uh, we really sort of started to understand this as a story about scientists with the General Armaments Department uh, who had been working on a particular technology uh, since the mid-1980s, who got a large infusion of funding uh, in the uh, aftermath of the Belgrade Embassy bombing, and who had a technology that had come to fruition that they really wanted to test to demonstrate uh, that, they, that they had actually, that they had not wasted the money, that they had developed something um, that was workable. And what, what struck me most in the process was the degree to which the, the Chinese decision-making system w was so, uh, the degree to which the Chinese decision-making system failed to anticipate the international reaction to the test, um, failed to see that conducting uh, a test like this uh, would be a net negative for China's security and would be widely perceived as something that was uh, irresponsible, dangerous, reckless, uh, and so forth. And one of the areas we dug into is, is why, that, why that viewpoint arose. And, and there are uh, lots of different reasons, but I think uh, w almost one of the most interesting things for me is, is the role that debris estimates played. I think Gregory showed you a slide that it illustrated the tremendous amount of debris the test caused. Uh, as far as we can tell, the debris estimates that were presented to the Chinese leadership were done by a research institute affiliated with the General Armaments Department, uh, the same people conducting the test. As you might imagine, they were not exactly independent. Uh, they, were, they were not the sort of folks who would have provided cautionary advice precisely because what their bosses wanted to do was to conduct a test. Uh, and it seems quite clear uh, in retrospect uh, that the General Armaments Department, if they, didn't, if they didn't provide faulty calculations, they certainly interpreted the highly technical calculations in a way that would have left Chinese policymakers unaware uh, of the sort of international reaction uh, that they were stepping into. Now, we did find that this wasn't a sort of bureaucratically uncoordinated uh, decision. Uh, people told us that the, the test was signed off on at the very highest levels. But after it was sort of signed off on with this, I think, mistaken view that this was just going to be a routine test and wouldn't have these you know, massive international implications, uh, there's a breakdown in the uh, paper flow uh, and the relevant uh, people in the foreign ministry uh, who were supposed to handle the public presentation of the test never never got their information, which led to this sort of remarkable situation where the Chinese say nothing for two weeks after the test. It's really uh, quite embarrassing for them, I think. Well, you know, in our in our discussions in China, um, I, I think we have the one thing that has come through over and over again is the degree to which people think that the test was probably a net negative for Chinese security and has sort of exacerbated. Um, their relations with the international space faring community. And, I, and, and it may be just grousing after the fact because people are upset. Um, almost everyone thinks if the United States had intervened and had expressed to the Chinese leadership that the, the flyby tests that they had conducted before they actually tried an intercept test were objectionable, that that might have been enough to tip the debate inside uh, the senior leadership and cause them not to carry out the test. Of course, we didn't. Uh, we didn't choose to do that uh, because we didn't want to engage with the Chinese in a discussion about military uses of outer space, and we didn't want to talk about missile defenses, which has been our position in the Conference on Disarmament when we're presented with treaties like this. And so I, I, I want to raise as, as a question um, this fundamental choice that Gregory had in his slide, which is, is that, is that the relation, is that the optimum relationship for the United States and China in space? Not engaging, not discussing, not cooperating, uh, precisely because we're worried that it might lead to some advantage for the Chinese down the road, or we're worried that some treaty might tie our hands. Now, that's not to say that I think a treaty is the optimal uh, mechanism uh, for engagement. Um, but I would like to note that I do think that there is a substantial role for transparency and confidence building measures and perhaps a code of conduct. Uh, and it seems to me that that's a view that's taking hold in the Bush administration right now. Uh, George Pataki, the former governor of New York, was the public delegate to the, um, the United Nations uh, General Assembly session. And in the debate on uh, disarmament <coughs> and military uses of outer space after lambasting the Chinese uh, for several paragraphs, and, and in some ways I think quite well deserved, for the ASAT test, he noted that there, he, he, he noted a sort of hint of support for the idea that short of a legal treaty, there might be things we could do to cooperate. And I, I, I would submit that I think that that is a, that is a sign of a beginning of, a, of enlightened thinking, uh, and enlightened thinking that I think derives from uh, what I was saying to uh, uh, one of the fellows who's joining us here today, uh, 
something that derives from the unique physical properties of orbit. We spend a lot of time talking about anti-satellite uh, systems and a lot of time talking about military uses of outer space, but we have profound and deep interests in the peaceful use of outer space. And those things are threatened not just by military systems, uh, but by the growth of orbital debris from routine uh, space operations and basically the need for traffic control, the crowding of orbits. And those are those are problems that we really can't solve in space with deterrence or threats or force. Those are things in which we need to actually solicit the active cooperation of one another. And you see a hint of that uh, in the decision to share uh, orbital data with the Chinese. I mean, if, if a country has a satellite in orbit and they don't know where their satellite is and they don't know where other satellites are, that's, that's a hazard to all countries. And a collision could create an enormous amount of debris, much like the ASAT test, uh, and really threaten the use of, of outer space. So it seems to me when we sit and look at this fundamental choice about whether or not our goal is to uh, you know, constrain and isolate the Chinese or cooperate with them, at least for me, one of the deciding factor is probably the degree to which operating in orbit does not allow you physically the choice of isolating people. Uh, and so that, that is where I take. I don't know if that means we sign a treaty. I, I suppose I doubt it. Uh, but I do think that that's a pretty good argument for code of conducts. Well, that's my, uh, that's my, uh, that's my pitch to you this afternoon. Uh, and so now uh, we will take uh, a series of questions from the audience, uh, and then we'll uh, let Gregory answer them. Uh, so do we have questions? Uh, OK, I'm going to do you, and then you, and you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Bill Jones from EIR. Uh, I'm also skeptical about the U.S. Uh, agreeing to any uh, you know, treaty with regard to arms in outer space, but I think given the impetus of the Chinese program, uh, which I think has helped to spur U.S. efforts in that direction, uh, that you will have activities going on with regard to lunar exploration and at a certain point lunar colonies and that cooperation at a certain point will become a necessity uh, within the astronaut corps, within NASA, uh, and the astronauts, there's a general uh, willingness to cooperate. They want to cooperate at some level, but opposition from the DOD and State Department on the technology transfer has made that very, very difficult. But at some point, uh, especially given the fact we're going to go have a new administration, soon, there, I think, will be moves towards creating some mode of cooperation with China in this program. And I'd like to ask uh, you particularly, what areas do you think the Chinese would be most willing and interested in working together? There's been some discussion about uh, um, the uh, life-saving measures in space, uh, joint ventures in that direction. Uh, because at some point, it's got to begin somewhere, and this technology transfer thing is not going to go away, but I think other uh, requirements and other necessities will be facing people that maybe they'll have to have a little bit of give on this issue. And I just wonder what areas would be most important in this And then in the back. No, that's you. Thank you. Uh, and shall deputy from CIPS, I have a question regarding uh, other possible security breaches, uh, underlying factors of the test in general last year. Uh, maybe China has non-US centric uh, condition for, for doing, conducting the test at the time that they did the test. Uh, just a day prior to um, doing the test itself, there were two Indian satellites sent up. And I was just wondering if you two could elaborate on other factors that are not US related that might be underlying the actual timing of the test. All right, three great questions. Just to recap, they, they are um, 
what do we make of uh, the allegations of Chinese espionage, uh, and particularly in light of the two, um, well, I guess two indictments of four people announced uh, by the Department of Justice uh, this weekend. Uh, if a new administration is interested in enhancing cooperation with China, what areas uh, would interest the Chinese? And uh, in terms of other possible motives for at least the timing of the test, uh, what about India? Wow. Well, on the first question, there's obviously a contradiction, right? And the decided policy of the United States now is that the risks of technology transfer and the costs are so great that uh, we're willing to pay whatever additional cost in terms of need to cooperate have to be paid in order to maintain that. But I question that, if only because, for example, in other areas, for example, cyber warfare, uh, which has become a, 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 an increasingly interesting and contentious area where we've also seen very aggressive and probably uh, organized efforts uh, out of China to disrupt uh, uh, information networks uh, in the United States and other parts of the world. Google, Sun, Microsoft, uh, Cisco, they all have huge corporate establishments. Uh, in Beijing, and the, 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 the fate of their bottom line and their corporate development rests uh, on those uh, enterprises that they've set up in China. So how do you separate in a globalized era this obvious technological interdependency and economic interdependency uh, from this question of security and technology and espionage? And I, it's obviously not an easy thing to answer, but I think in the space case, we've made this incredibly clean break where we cut off all possible forms of collaboration and cooperation without even carefully, carefully analyzing what the technology transfer risks would be. So to get to the second part of that question, are there areas where in space we can cooperate with a reasonable degree of security about the fact that the Chinese are not going to acquire any technology or expertise that will be militarily useful? And I would have to think, without having looked at that in a technical sense, that there must be. Um, for example, this whole question of Chinese participation in the International Space Station. Now, China's had its own space station plans in the books, and they talk about it when they talk about the steps of their piloted program, about the space station being their third step. Uh, supposed to come on board 2017. They're building the new launch vehicle, uh, the heavy, heavier, heavier lift vehicle, the new launch pad down in Hainan Island to carry it. The space station is going to be one of the original projects uh, along with the second and third uh, lunar probes, which will be heavier uh, than the one that they sent up uh, uh, last year. Um, there was uh, Zhang Qingwei, who was the new head of the uh, Chinese Commission on Science and Industry for National Defense, cost in dropped a huge hint in the newspaper about, well, we haven't really committed to the space station yet, the Chinese independent space station yet. Uh, and, you know, uh, in other words, the funding wasn't there for that yet. The, the final decision to go ahead with that wasn't there yet, if there were other options. And I think the other option that he was talking about was participation in the International Space Station. And from my conversations with Chinese colleagues, they don't entertain the possibility of human participation anytime soon. They don't think they're ready. They're going to do their first spacewalk next year. They're going to do their first docking maneuver next year. They have a lot of learning to do about how to operate in space before they're going to feel comfortable uh, doing any sort of docking maneuver or taking a Chinese vehicle, uh, a manned vehicle to the space station. But they are interested in some nominal participation which will recognize the fact that this is an international space station and they're the only space-faring nation that's not participating in it. Uh, it's a quest for respect, admission into the international space community as a nation in good standing or whatever. So I think uh, the NASA package that uh, Al Condes had put together for Michael Griffin before he went over and that they actually were going to broach before the last crisis, which was the EP3 incident, that package that he had put together was on, on space science missions, which uh, I think would probably be a very comfortable area for the U.S. to start. And you can see this happening with the Europeans already. They have a number of different space science missions, the uh, Double Star, where they're doing these magnetic uh, field studies 
where they had European designed and Chinese launched uh, satellites and they're sharing the data. Uh, so I think these kinds of, China has a solar project coming up, maybe some sort of U.S. participation in the Chinese lunar pro uh, probes and uh, uh, Chinese participation in the uh, U.S. lunar probes or Mars probes. There's this probe, the uh, cooperation with the Russians on a Mars probe. So those sorts of space science missions would probably be the most appropriate. And to the third question of India, I know that there, from, our, from the brief contacts we've had, I have no knowledge of India, zip, zero, none. Never been there, don't know many people from there, don't know what their attitudes are at all, especially regarding space. But in the international conferences we've attended with Indians present, um, they don't seem to be harping on uh, uh, competition, uh, but you do see it in their newspapers. But based on the fact that I've looked at the way we look at Chinese newspapers and how we read them, I don't trust this reading of the Indian press as some sort of indication of the intentions of the Indian government. I think we need to be very careful about that. Um, and I would doubt that something as complicated uh, and long planned, uh, because for example there were two flybys of this test, that the timing of this had something to do with those Indian satellite launches. I, I don't know though, but it just doesn't sound as if those two things would necessarily be connected to me. Before I, before I take a couple more questions, I mean, the thing I would say about the timing issue is, you know, this was the third of a series of tests that had been carried out over, I think, the past 18 months. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so it, you know, it really isn't, I mean, it came as a shock to us, right, because it was a, it was a big event, but it, it was something that seemed, seemed well planned. And I, and I would caution, I would caution in people against thinking that there was a message intended with the test. I mean, that, that tends to be the thing that we always instinctively do uh, as Americans is look for the message for us in the test. And I, and I think the thing that comes out of the bureaucratic account is the Chinese didn't think they were sending a message or they didn't understand the content of the message. And so they weren't, you know, if they, if they had thought they were sending a message, they would have paid more attention to the delivery of, that the delivery of it. And, and, and I, you know, what I took away from this was a bureaucratic breakdown um, and and a sort of tone deafness when it comes to the reaction of others uh, and a set of challenges for the Chinese government moving forward both in their civil space policy uh, but also uh, generally in their their security policy so here's one and then okay great please I'm Michael Zaz, and I'm a former C3 To what degree do you think the ASAT test was a departure and uh, a perceived departure from Deng's 19 character statement? And also, more broadly, how does it fit into the narrative of national humiliation? Good one. And then in front, and I see you in the back, I'll get you in the next round. Uh, Travis Romans, Institute of World Politics. Uh, don't you think, doesn't it seem that after the ASAT, ASAT test, there is a tension between China's civil space goals and its military space goals? And do you think that? That the fact that those goals sometimes seem at odds is being manifested in the space community there? Okay, so again, uh, to recap, um, again, three really good questions. Comparing and contrasting the polemical communities in both countries. Uh, this issue of, of uh, the 19 character statement and, and the role of national humiliation, to which I would add, I mean, you know, is this a, you know, is, is this a desire not to be the Qing dynasty? Um, and, and then uh, the third is, I'm sorry, it was tension. Yeah, tension between their space. Or oh, right, tension between the, goals. right, the, between the civil and the military goals. Right. On the first question, um, they feed off each other for sure. Uh, all, it, in, for example, some of the books that have been quoted, for example, Space War, Warfare by this guy, Li Da Guang. Um, Li Da Guang is a, I think he's a colonel. He holds an academic chair at NDU. Um, I mean, it's the quintessential definition of a non-relevant <laughs> participant in this debate. Um, and yet his book has gotten an enormous play in the US. This book, Unrestricted Warfare, which got played back in the uh, 90s, written by two colonels from the same 
spot in the bureaucracy. You know, China divides its military into sort of logistics, politics, uh, command, and some whole logistics, some strong armaments, right? So there's this whole political uh, side, you know, indoctrination side to the to the Chinese military, which their uh, academic institutions are part. And a lot of the authors on this space warfare, the polemics of space warfare uh, in China, are people who sit in those positions. Uh, and they start writing in large numbers after the Gulf War about this. It's a big media event. It's obviously fodder for a lot of information. There's also needs to reassure, uh, you know, uh, rank and file members of the military. Um, our people read that, come to some judgments about the Chinese, uh, publish those judgments. Their people read our assessments, and this has been going back and forth for 15 years now. And so there's this whole tiny dialogue between these two hawkish communities in both countries that sort of dominates the entire discussion of this uh, in the public domain that I've come across looking in the U.S. Now, I have no access to classified information. I don't know what's going on inside the intelligence agencies uh, in the U.S. in terms of what they're reading. But what's appearing in things like the Pentagon reports seems to be informed by these very low quality, uh, non-involved, <coughs> non-technically specific Chinese sources. Whereas if you look in the aerospace journals, you know, they're talking about how to do specific things. Good example, in the one of the, I think it was the 2002 annual report, uh, they were talking about laser, uh, ASAS, uh, laser capabilities, and they had mentioned news reports that showed Chinese interest or some vague language like that. I don't know what the specific language might have been. But if they'd have taken the time to look through the technical sources, uh, the Chinese did a very uh, uh, careful set of analysis of the miracle tests when the United States tested uh, uh, a laser. And in the middle of that, they, they're describing their own capabilities relative to ours in terms of adaptive optics and things like that. So there's specific information that you can dig out of those things that would be more valuable than this sort of polemical stuff that goes on in trying to debate uh, Chinese intentions. Um, the second part had to do the second question. Oh, the second question was about national humiliation. Yeah, I think statement. that's something that somehow has just been discovered. <laughs> Uh, by U.S. analysts, you know, this national humiliation argument uh, has become, you know, talked about for a while. I mean, in, if you go to the Chinese uh, history, modern history museum uh, in, uh, uh, off of uh, Tiananmen Square, I used to take students through this every semester at the beginning of every semester, and you start with the Opium War, and you sort of walk through up to liberation. Um, you, you, you get the sense that uh, with, you know, May 4th, new culture, uh, that it was, uh, well, in the May 4th year, it was democracy and science were the things that were holding China back. Uh, uh, and that this inability to compete with the West is sort of a long-running narrative in, in Chinese history. And of course, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, because it was able to <coughs> defeat and break with the West and sort of, uh, you know, uh, stand China on, on its own two feet and let it, you know, uh, proceed upon an independent course, was sort of the beginning of the end of that era. I don't think that narrative, uh, while inculcated into every educated uh, Chinese because of the classes they take in history uh, in, in schools, um, uh, is as relevant as it's been made to uh, 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 seem in the U.S. debate. And I think the problem here is we get this sense of this is Nazi Germany, again. Uh, this is Meiji Japan, again. Uh, these rapidly modernizing, fast sociological change, uh, nationalistic sentiment that, uh, uh, that develops among uh, uh, suddenly more aware and uh, higher educated uh, intellectual elite. Uh, I don't see that happening, uh, and I don't see that national humiliation thing being a prominent narrative. It certainly exists, uh, and there's people who talk about it. And the, the whole debate over kicking Starbucks out of uh, the Forbidden City, for example, is one really interesting debate about how, you know, there was a Starbucks in the Forbidden City and uh, there was no other Chinese coffee shop in the Forbidden City and why was this foreign coffee shop in our greatest national treasure and one Chinese television anchor, you know, brought this to the attention of the public and it became a cause celeb for a while. So there is this narrative that runs through, but I don't think at the upper levels of the Chinese policy making apparatus that this is, a, this is something that's driving their decision making. Although the sense of resentment that I talk about is very real, I think it has more to do with actual things that have happened to them in interacting with Americans over the course of their professional careers <coughs> rather than this larger historical narrative about national humiliation. And the tension between the civil and the military goals. 
Well, I think that's that's true. In and there are multiple actors with multiple goals, with multiple funding streams, with multiple interests. For example, there's a conflict between uh, surprise, the piloted people and the robotic people in China. Um, some of the people who are leading figures in the manned space program, piloted space program, don't know if it's worth the money. And they actually want to talk to the United States about, well, why did you do it, right? I mean, what were your, and I couldn't organize that conversation because of fears of deemed export control violations between having ex-retired NASA officials sit down with some of these senior Chinese aerospace people and have a conversation like that. That's how strict and severe this cut off because we want to protect ourselves from technology leaks has taken. We can't even have a, we can't even have a dialogue about something as basic as that with the Chinese. Uh, so yes, there's an obvious tension between uh, this. For example, there's a senior uh, Chinese engineer, his name's Du Xiangwan. I think he's the vice director of the Chinese Academy of Engineering. He's been arguing uh, at different meetings in different fora for years uh, about space debris and the need to preserve uh, uh, the, the sustainable use of outer space. He gave a paper on that uh, at, at our conference in, in Beijing in 2004. He's published that talk in, in mag party magazines like Chou Shi. Uh, uh, you know, so so there's a debate. There's a there's a fertile, ongoing discussion about these issues among different opinions in the in the Chinese aerospace and military communities. Um, so the tension's obvious to them too. And the last one? No, that was it. Was it? That was three. Okay, that was three. Uh, we had uh, one way in the back, and then over here. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to go in front and then over here. Uh, sorry, there was a gentleman with a mustache who had his hand up. Is now yes, you. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the overall view that China is not uh, uh, a threat, uh, we've seen that uh, they have acquired cutting edge aircraft, uh, Soviet design. Uh, they're getting sovereign money destroyers. Uh, Soviet design. They're building ships of their own. Uh, they're building and uh, developing eight different classes of submarines, including the Jin class, uh, which can uh, have infinite range of nuclear power. It has uh, nuclear tipped missiles that have a range of almost 5,000 miles, so that they can be well into the Pacific and they can hit New York or Washington. And they say that this is necessary because they want to retake Taiwan, which is 100 miles from the coast of China. Uh, there are people in the United States who see in this uh, that there is a threat uh, that China is getting set to take on the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, do you, however, see that there is no problem, there is uh, uh, no threat from Chinese and uh, 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 the ASAP test that they did on a missile uh, is also not a threat. Uh, they're blinding one of our military satellites with a laser is not a threat. But we can trust China and we can cooperate with them. <clears throat> and then uh, over on the right. Hi, uh, I very much enjoyed your talk uh, Obviously, it's an important day in Washington. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to take the very first question, um, and then and then do a little self promotion on 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 the last. But the the answer to the first question is I think there is zero likelihood that the United States is going to accept a negotiating mandate in the CDE to talk about the draft treaty or sign that draft treaty. Uh, the draft treaty looks a lot like the previous ones. Uh, there's no reason to believe that the Bush administration feels any differently about it today than it did, uh, you know, six years ago. Uh, 
Uh, and it's also worth noting that the Clinton administration wasn't particularly enthusiastic uh, about, about such a treaty. I, for me, though, I mean, the question is whether or not we can get a, a, a work program in the Conference on Disarmament that allows us to talk about these issues, and whether or not we can make practical progress on things like transparency and confidence building measures and a code of conduct. Because again, as I, as I, I made the argument earlier, you know, space is a unique physical environment where you just cannot, you can't seize and hold it the way you might, uh, the way you might land. You can't dominate it in, in the way you would uh, air, right? It, 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 you have to cooperate in order to manage traffic, in order to manage debris. And so I think it's those physical realities that account for this line in George Pataki's speech uh, and, and that do create a condition for some, some degree of of uh, discussion now, in terms of the, the space policy, I, I mean, I think we're generally having a, having a discussion about the need to engage China. But I would say that uh, the New America Foundation and the Center for Defense Information uh, are kicking off a project on writing a new draft national space policy, uh, which would be uh, the, uh, the which would be our advice to the next administration. Uh, but we haven't convened any of those meetings yet, so I, I'll have to ask you to be to be patient. Gregory, did you want to talk generally about the... Uh, well, let me address the, the second yeah. question in particular. I think uh, China's acquisition of advanced military technologies, all the ones you described, is a, presents a real, credible, and growing <coughs> threat to the United States. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, I think you can see the, the professional military in the United States are very concerned uh, about all of those developments and how they're going to manage this military modernization problem uh, uh, that China is going through. But I think what I'm trying to say is that we're, we have many ways we can manage that threat. Uh, one of the tools is obviously uh, hardware, military, tactical you know, responses. I think we're neglecting diplomacy, cooperation, uh, and dialogue. And to the extent that we've had dialogue, I think it's been intermittent, interrupted, uh, and the interlocutors have not been the best types of people on both sides, of the, especially the mill-mill uh, conversations. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily true. There are some very interesting things going on with strategic nuclear uh, issues. Um, but the, the level of dialogue and the quality of dialogue uh, is also should be seen as a threat management capability. And I don't think that we have, uh, as well as our intelligence capabilities, I think at least in the space area, which is the only one that I've looked at, our intelligence capabilities do not appear from the information in the public domain to be very strong at all. As a matter of fact, they appear to be quite weak, especially when it comes to linguistic capabilities. And then you don't even want to talk about the kind of cultural background knowledge you need to understand what it is you're reading. Uh, and if you needed any, there have been one, two, three, four GAO studies on Chinese language staff in NSA and the FBI and state and CIA. And uh, in the senior analyst positions, 75% do not meet the language requirements of their position, according to the GAO. Uh, we're relying a lot on the Foreign Broadcast Information Service to do open source analysis, and the Foreign Broadcast Information Service contracts out to any Chinese language speaker anywhere. They may have no particular expertise on the article that they're reading. We seem to select these things. We focus on things like the PLA Daily, for example, uh, uh, and, and web logs, and we're sort of ignoring this mountain of information that's available to us in open source. China has something called the China National Knowledge Infrastructure. It was started with World Bank funding back in the mid-1990s, and it's a digital archive of everything in print that they, they want to pour into it. It has books, periodicals, newspapers, master's degree dissertations, doctoral degree dissertations, conference proceedings, 35 million discrete articles as of the last time I looked, which was about two weeks ago. And they're adding, you know, thousands every day to this archive. They have the Qing Dynasty histories digitally searchable full text online. They're building a national digital library. And the, the 1,500 sources that were returned in my ASAT search, for example, I searched this. You can search it online, over the internet, from anywhere in the world. Now, searches, results that you get searching from an IP address in China are different than search results from an IP address in the United States. And there's all kinds of ways they have of managing access to different articles. But you can download the full text, Chinese text, of 
all kinds of information, and it doesn't appear to me as if our intelligence agencies are making use of that. Uh, and even the ones that they do read, their interpretations suggest that they can't discern credible from non-credible information, as in the case of this parasite satellite. They're unable to discern authoritative from non-authoritative authors. Uh, they don't think about the audience of some of these publications or the reasons for these publications, who they're meant to address and what purpose they're meant to serve, which suggests a lack of cultural knowledge that's needed to interpret the, the uh, source material that you're reading. So it's not, and I don't want anyone to walk away with the impression that I'm saying China's not a threat and they're lovely and everything's going to get along just fine. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there are important non-military ways to do threat management, and we seem to be uh, ignoring that half of our capability. Uh, it's, a lot, it's been allowed to atrophy, and one of the reasons it's atrophying isn't because there isn't robust exchange from the United States. Every U.S. major multinational has great Chinese language speaking staff and fantastic analysts who you know, tear apart the profitability and, and processes of Chinese companies and corporations. It's not that the people don't exist. It's that they're not working for the government. Uh, and that's something that we, that we need to think about. We have any more? Ah, did I? Yes. Go ahead. I'm the only one. Yep. Well, at this exact <laughs> moment. From Masaoka Associates, a local firm. Um, back in the 60s, when I went to college, um, there were a lot of graduate students who were Indians. And in those days, you didn't talk about the Chinese communists. Um, but today, uh, if you go to a number of any of these uh, uh, major U.S. engineering institutions, first of all, there are a large number of, in fact, sometimes the Chinese uh, graduate students outnumber the Americans. Uh, some of the professors are Chinese. And I, I think I welcome that. Uh, knowledge, uh, you cannot build boundaries. So, you know, wh what are we talking about? Uh, uh, spying for information when the Chinese uh, professors are teaching American students how to perhaps build rockets. Uh, I wonder, uh, and in this context, can you give us a perspective of how much, uh, perhaps, uh, how many of the top scientists in the U.S. in, in China today are ex-U.S. students, for example, uh, and uh, or, or perhaps even European uh, graduates? But I think most of them, since the U.S. is so generous in providing scholarships to foreigners, including myself, uh, that the trend uh, may continue. If, if we have no more questions, I think, I think that's a great place to leave it. I mean, I, 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 Gregory and I, I often joke, the principal designer of China's first nuclear weapon got his Ph.D. at Purdue University. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so to some extent, these, these linkages have always existed, but I mean, I mean that's that's your specialty, right? Right. Which is what is what are what are the what are the future prospects of scientific and technical collaboration between the United States and China in an increasingly globalized world? I don't know the numbers um, precisely, uh, but for example, I got to go to China because of uh, biology professor Shane Balcom at the University of Maryland, who was a geneticist, who in the late 1970s was bringing Chinese graduate students over, and we asked him to send some. American graduate students the other way, and that's how I got my opportunity to go. Um, at the time, the chair of the biology department was Chinese American, the chair of the physics department was Chinese American, this was at the University of Maryland College Park, and the chair of the, of, of the mathematics department was Chinese American. And I suspect that trend has probably only gotten more pronounced uh, in the years since the early 1980s to today. There are data available on that question. There's something called uh, uh, the oh, as I, I'll try to. Is that they, there's uh, data that's kept on uh, exchanges and who's studying where. I will say something sad on this question about the space area, which gets me back to the main point. Um, there are uh, returned students and faculty uh, who did their degrees in the United States, teaching in all these leading Chinese uh, institutions, and in the space community, there are a number of individuals who are afraid to call their colleagues and students in the United States because of these deemed export control laws. Uh, so they can't even have conversations of a familial nature uh, because their U.S. colleagues are so intimidated by the fear of prosecution uh, that they don't want to, uh, they, don't want to, they don't want to create problems for their, for, for, their, for, their, for their graduate students or their friends that they've left behind in the United States. Um, 
And I thoroughly agree that uh, scientific and technical progress in today's era is a global, science is a global enterprise. And so uh, the idea that we can wall off little pieces of it for some narrow uh, technical or military benefit, I think is something that needs to be seriously examined uh, as a, we seem to assume it's the smart thing to do, better safe than sorry. Uh, but I don't think that that axiom uh, necessarily holds true. I think it needs to be looked at very, very carefully. Well, I think that's just fantastic. Please join me in thanking Gregory.